Hello, fellow historians. This lecture is on Manifest Destiny, the ideology that propelled America from the original 13 states on the Atlantic coast all the way to the Pacific Ocean in less than 100 years, one of the greatest national expansions in human history, Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was an ideology specific to the United States that provided a moral, spiritual, an intellectual bedrock and justification for an expansionist vision. In little less than 100 years, the fledgling U.S. conquered, annexed, and transformed the landscape, taking the American Republic from the East Coast to the West Coast. The taking of a large part of the continent in less than 100 years stands out as one of the greatest expansions in human history in such a short amount of time. Inextricably tied to providential blessing, it was the greatest national expansion since Muslim armies took over half of Christendom in the seventh century as it spread its civilization and ideology. Studying a historical phenomenon like Manifest Destiny is different than studying tangible moments like the Civil War, the Mexican-American War, or slavery. Manifest Destiny was an idea, a national zeitgeist. We cannot point to an event that is the Manifest Destiny moment. In order to understand an idea, we need to examine what leaders said and how their words represent the greater worldview of the nation and the application of that worldview in real ways as America pushed West. Manifest Destiny, the unique American idea, comprises six main elements. A belief in the mission of the U.S. to conquer, redeem, and transform the Western landscape in the American image. Emphasis on mission rooted in the Old Testament promised land concept and the New Testament Great Commission. Now, this is something you'll hear me say um, often in my lectures on American history, that to understand a major thread or foundation of American history, you really need to understand the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testament, especially um, the first half of, Amer of, of, the Amer of American history. If you want to understand the Puritans and Quakers, you need to know the Bible. If you, have, if you want to understand any people of any age, know the books and documents they are reading, the books that influence their worldview. And certainly the Bible is part of this idea of Western, um, of spreading West and manifest destiny. A belief in an undeniable destiny to accomplish the above providential duty like the biblical calling. If you know your Old Testament, uh, oftentimes um, the God of the Old Testament called the prophets with an audible voice. This is where we get the word, this is where we get the concept of calling. God calls you to a profession. God calls America to spread westward. Now when I say this, of course, I don't believe this. I'm, I'm telling you what, um, the, what this idea encompasses, what many people believe at this time. That's, that God was calling America westward. <clears throat> a belief that God himself handpicked America and the Americans as his chosen people to accomplish the above points, to spread civilization, progress, technology, Christianity, education, and American ideals, foremost American ideals, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This is firmly rooted in the Old Testament Torah chosen people concept, and all that concept entails a hyper self-worth self compared to native peoples, racism, genocide, and a vast territory for the taking. Now, this is often a hard subject, right? When we get to, when we get to the 19th century, we do have the seeds of modern racism. Um, it's hard to talk about racism um, before slavery comes to the shores of the United States or what will become the United States. Certainly there was prejudices 
based on skin color. But by the 19th century, we do have leaders in America talking about race, using that word, we're using the terminology of race, of the Anglo-Saxon century, um, the black race is inferior, um, the Mongoloid uh, Mexican race is inferior. They're using these terms themselves. This is not uh, an imposition of terminology that I am using or other historians, but by this time, um, these ideas are floating around that the Anglo-Saxon race is superior to um, black and brown peoples and yellow and, and Asians. <clears throat> a belief in American exceptionalism, a belief that the spe special virtues and character of the United States, the American people and national institutions are higher in all measures above any other nation culture or people ever to have existed or presently existing. More so, uh, more except, <laughs> we can use the word more, the term more exceptional, right? Than ancient Athens, than Rome or any other nation. Um, these, these civilizations did not measure in any way to the US. A belief in Anglo-American cultural and racial superiority as exceptional and chosen people. A belief in an exuberant optimism. And we have to really understand that this ideology um, pushes America westward with this excitement. This is a, a growing, progressive, educated, idealistic, generally speaking, um, population. The 13 original colonies and states cannot hold these people. They're pushing westward. They need room for farmland to grow, um, for grow, growing families as agricultural technology progresses and is able to grow more food for more people and healthier food for healthier people. And as people become more educated, um, the 13 colonies cannot hold these people, 13 states. This is a, a progressive, educated, um, energized people. And we have to understand this exuberant optimism that is shrouding America or um, pushing America westward. And if we, have, if we want to understand manifest destiny. In an exuberant optimism that the future of America is progressing toward an unending zenith of possibilities. And here are a couple of quotes from Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. I use this acronym POTUS, POTUS, that's floating around these days. I don't use it in any disrespectful manner, but it saves space. He was the third president. We know that um, George Washington was the first and John Adams was the second and um, Thomas Jefferson was the third president. And I, I have these two quotes in juxtaposition next to each other to show the biblical influence um, so this quote, um, Thomas Jefferson to James Madison, another founding father, April 27th, 1809. And Thomas Jefferson says, we should have such an empire for liberty as she has never surveyed since her creation. Again, this idea of um, American exceptionalism, that there has never been a nation like America since the creation, an empire for liberty. And that seems like a contradiction of terms, right? In empire, we don't think of liberty and freedoms um, side by side with or um, linked with empire. We often think of autocracy, um, dictatorship, um, the oppression of peoples when we think of empire. But Jefferson is thinking about an empire for liberty. This is an amazing concept, an empire for liberty. Um, the expansion of America, um, and the expansion of American ideals, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, spreading liberty and freedom to peoples around the world. This has been a major thread in American history as, as America has fought wars across the world. Um, oftentimes, wars are shredded with this terminology that America is spreading freedom and liberty. And I think it begins here with this quote from Jefferson, very powerful quote an empire for liberty, as she has never surveyed since the creation. And I am persuaded no constitution was ever before 
so well calculated as ours for extensive empire and self-government laws and jefferson saying is saying that there's never been <clears throat> such a legal document since the beginning of human existence human civilization mesopotamia hammurabi's codes um, the constitutions coming out of um, england that as we see the evolution of liberty and freedoms beginning in england and evolving to the united states there's never been a document um, like the constitution and i want to juxtapose this with deuteronomy 4 5 from the english standard version of the bible these are the laws for you to obey when you arrive in the land where you will live they are from the lord our god he has given them to me to pass on to you if you obey them they will give you a reputation for wisdom and intelligence for what other nation great or small has god among them as the lord our god is here among us whenever we call upon him now i believe this is moses speaking i could be wrong <laughs> i should have checked but i think it's moses and what nation no matter how great has laws as fair as these I am giving you today. And you can certainly see the biblical influence there um, that Jefferson is alluding to. Whether he, whether he is conscious about it or not, um, these founding fathers um, all come from Protestant traditions and were brought up steeped in biblical, biblical tradition. So this is a worldview that they can't, can't not help but, but pull from because they were brought up in this type of um, environment. Here's a great map that shows the, um, the expansion of the American Republic from the original 13 um, going westward. Um, the nation doubles its size under Thomas Jefferson with the Louisiana Purchase, and then again with the war with Mexico, doubles its size once more with the war 1846 to 1848. Amazing expansion, one of the greatest in history, as I mentioned, in such a little short amount of time. Here's one of the first um, steps toward empire that Jefferson is talking about, empire of liberty. In order to gain this empire, America, um, as America pushes westward, there are nations to conquer. There are sovereign nations to conquer there in the way of this empire of liberty. And one of them is Mexico. Mexico encompasses this great area right here. A sovereign nation, not at war at all with the United States as it's pushing westward, but a problem because after the purchase of the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon, um, this nation, Mexico, that had just won its independence from, from Spain, is in the way of American progress westward. Um, and that's a problem for those who want to see America push toward the Pacific Ocean. Mexico's in the way. Manifest Destiny, the Path to Empire, the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848. What was the Mexican-American War? The Mexican-American War was a military conflict between the U.S. and Mexico. The Texas Revolution and annexation of Texas as a state in the American Union angered Mexico, who viewed the annexation as an illegal land grab by a greedy, ever-expanding United States. Americans believed in manifest destiny, and Mexico was a roadblock to taking their civilization from coast to coast. Apart from the Texas Revolution, no major antagonisms characterized the relationship between the two nations. Westward expansion alone, manifest destiny, was the major cause for the war. At the conclusion of the war in 1848, Mexico and the United States signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Mexico lost nearly half of its territory, including what is today California, Nevada, Arizona, Utah, and parts of New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. With the signing of the treaty and the previous annexation of Texas, the United States once again nearly doubled its size manifest destiny fulfilled. Now I'd like to look at a few um, slides with primary sources 
that act as foundations for the manifest destiny worldview. And, and I believe that one of the, the foundational documents of American exceptionalism was not just what I believe, but many scholars um, hold this to be true, that one of the foundations for American exceptionalism is John Winthrop's sermon um, and the excerpt from his sermon, um, City Upon a Hill. And this is the quote from this um, foundation, foundational American document and, and Puritan sermon. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us, when 10 of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. You know, this is very Old Testament. This term, this kind of um, picture he's painting is very Old Testament. When he shall make us pre when he shall make us a praise and glory that men shall say of succeeding plantations, may the Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. So what John Winthrop is saying is that they are coming to America to found a colony, a plantation, to plant a Christian colony in the Americas. That as it grows, it will be like a lighthouse beacon for all the world to see that God is blessing his chosen people in the new world. And their example will radiate, radiate throughout the whole world as a city upon a hill. Exceptional, American exceptionalism, that God is blessing this new plantation, a, a plantation of Christians in the new world. Here's another from, um, well, my French is really bad, Saint Jean de Crivecule, I think. Letters from an American farmer. He came um, right before um, the revolution broke out, I think a, a decade or two before the revolution, and traveled around the colonies. Um, and observing um, what Americans were like. And this is a, a quote from his, his letters. Many ages will not see the shores of our great lakes replenished with inland nations, nor the unknown bounds of North America entirely populated. Who can tell how far it extends? Who can tell the millions of men whom it will feed and contain? For no European foot has yet traveled half the extent of this mighty continent, right? This, I, this is the idea that the possibilities are endless. There's a wide expanse of territory for this new fledgling nation to overtake. And who, who could even imagine how far it goes? The possibilities are endless. Again, this quote from Jefferson, this is Thomas Jefferson, founding father, author of the Declaration of Independence, um, and third president of the United States. Again, I'll read this quote, that's a powerful quote. We should have such an empire for liberty as she has never surveyed since the creation. And I am persuaded that no constitution was ever before so well calculated as ours for extensive empire and self-government. And here's a second quote from Jefferson. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God, like right? farmers. Thomas Jefferson imagined America as populated by yeoman farmers, educated yeoman farmers, self-sufficient with home libraries, educated with farmers. This is his vision for America. And these are the chosen people of God, as opposed to Native Americans um, who um, generally not farmers, although some were, um, especially in um, central Mexico and the East Coast, but the vast majority of uh, American Natives were not farmers, but hunter gatherers. And I think he's making this just juxtaposition here with Natives, even though he doesn't say it. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. If ever he had a chosen people, whose breast he has made his peculiar deposit for substantial and genuine virtue. And this again goes to American exceptionalism. Jefferson is saying that there is something 
God imbued in American farmers, that God has touched them. And this idea, of course, um, signifies some kind of touching of the Holy Spirit, that God has placed within American farmers this special treasure of genuine virtue, um, exceptional of all the people of the earth. These are the chosen people of God. This is powerful. The chosen people of God. Here, is, here are a few quotes from President James Polk, the president who was serving um, during the war with Mexico. So there was great clamor in, in Washington and throughout the United States to take Mexico. But there, were all, there was also voices saying, we cannot take Mexico because this goes against who we are. We just, a few decades previous, we just fought the greatest empire of the, in the world, Great Britain. And, and we saw ourselves as different than the, an imperial power. We were the underdogs fighting imperialism, fighting global expansion. We were rebels, freedom fighters who fought in empire. And now we are going to fight against a sovereign nation for the same purpose, for the sole purpose of expansion and for empire. And, and a young Thomas, I'm oh, sorry, Tom, a young um, Lincoln, who was a senator, rose up and spoke um, in Congress, speaking against territorial expansion um, and others also. Um, but President Polk ran on a platform when he ran for president of territorial expansion. Um, and this is from his inaugural address, 1845, a year before the war with Mexico. I regard the question of annexation as belonging exclusively to the United States and Texas. To enlarge its limits is to extend the dominions of peace over additional territories and increasing millions the world has nothing to fear from military ambition in our government. Foreign powers should therefore look on the annexation of Texas to the United States, not as a conquest of a nation seeking to extend her dominions by arms and violence, but as a peaceful acquisition of a territory once her own, by adding another member to our confederation with the consent of that member, thereby diminishing the chances of war and opening to, the, opening to them new and ever increasing markets for their products. Our title to the country of the Oregon is clear and unquestionable and already are our people preparing to perfect that title by occupying it with their wives and children. But 80 years ago, our population was confined to the, on the West by the ridge of the Alleghenies. Within that period, Within the lifetime, I might say, of some of my hearers, our people increasing to many millions have filled the eastern valley of the Mississippi, adventurously ascended the Missouri to its head springs, and are already engaged in establishing the blessing of self-government in valleys of which the rivers flow to the Pacific. The world belongs, the peaceful triumphs of the industry of our immigrants. To us belongs the duty of protecting them adequately wherever they may be upon our soil. The jurisdiction of our laws and the benefits of our Republican institutions should be extended over them in the distant regions which they have selected for their homes. So of course what he's saying is our, our immigrants are already going there. And this is something we don't often hear, right? That, um, that early 19th century immigration to Oregon country in California, Americans were immigrating to Mexico. This is what they were doing. We don't often cr um, frame the conversation in historical examination that way, that Americans were, were, were immigrating to Mexico, but this was the case. And what Polk is saying is that our people were already there. So we have to take it to protect them, right? Um, and the foundational document for Manifest Destiny is John O'Sullivan's, he was a journalist um, on Manifest Destiny, 1839. And pay attention to the words that he's using. Words really matter, right? Words have impact. And this is from his, um, his document. 
1839. The American people having derived their origin from many other nations and the Declaration of National Independence being entirely based on the great principle of human, human equality. This goes back to Jefferson's Empire of Liberty. These facts demonstrate at once our disconnected position as regards any other nation. Now this of course goes to American exceptionalism. Um, John Sullivan is gonna say, America is different than any other nation that's ever existed. It's something new. It doesn't have ties to the past. It doesn't have ties to history. It is something entirely new and special. That we have in reality, but little connection with the past history of any of them, and still less with all antiquity. Antiquity means ancient history, right? Egypt, Athens, Rome, its glories or its crimes. On the contrary, our national birth was the beginning of a new history. The formation and progress of an untried political system, which separates us from the past and connects us, it connects us with the future only. And so far as regards the entire development of natural rights of man in moral, political, and national life, we may confidently assume that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity. America is destined for better deeds. It is so destined because the principle upon which a nation is organized fixes its destiny and that of equality is perfect, is universal. It presides in all the operations of the physical world. And it is also the conscious law of the soul. The self-evident dictates of morality, which accurately defines the duty of man to man, and consequently man's rights as man. Besides, the truthful annals of any nation furnish abundant evidence that its happiness, its greatness, its duration were always propor proportionate to the democratic equality in its system of government. The expansive future is our arena and for our history. We are entering on its untrodden space with the truths of God in our minds, beneficent objects in our hearts, and with a clear conscience unsullied by the past. We are the nation of human progress. And who will, what can, set limits to our onward march? Providence is with us, and no earthly power can. We point to the everlasting truth on the first page of our national declaration. And we proclaim to the millions of other lands, the gates of hell, the powers of aristocracy and monarchy shall not prevail against it. The far reaching, the boundless future will be their era of American greatness in its magnificent domain of space and time, the nation of many nations is destined to manifest to mankind the excellence of divine principles, to establish on earth the noblest temple ever dedicated to the worship of the Most High, the sacred and the true. Its floor shall be a hemisphere, its roof the firmament of the star-studded heavens, and its congregation... That was the more started going by, okay. Its floor shall be a hemisphere, its roof the firmament of the star-studded heavens, and its congregation a union of many republics, comprising hundreds of happy millions, calling, owning no man-master, but governed by God's natural and moral law of equality, the law of brotherhood, of peace, and good will amongst men. Yes, we are the nation of progress, of individual freedom, of universal enfranchisement. Equality of rights is a signature of our union of states, the grand exemplar of the correlative equality of individuals. And while truth sheds its effluence, we cannot retrograde without dissolving the one and subverting the other. We must onward to the fulfillment of our mission, the entire development of the principle of our organization, freedom of conscience, freedom of person, freedom of trade and business pursuits, universality of freedom and equality. Last one, 
This is our high destiny and in nature's eternal, inevitable decree of cause and effect. We must accomplish it. We must accomplish it. All this will be our future history to establish on earth the moral dignity and salvation of man. This is amazing language, isn't it? He's saying the nation, this mission is man's salvation. The immutable truth and beneficence of God for this blessed mission to the nations of the world. You can, you can see, I'll stop right there, you can see how this builds upon John Winthrop's um, city upon a hill that was given 200 years before, right? This blessed mission to the nations of the world, which are shut out from the life-giving light of truth, has America been chosen? America's hand chosen by God. And her a high example shall smite to death the tyranny of kings, hierarchs, and oligarchs. And carry the glad tidings of peace and goodwill where myriads now endure in existence scarcely more enviable than that of beasts of the field. Who then can doubt that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity? This is from his his work, The Great Nation of Futurity, um, the foundational document for Manifest Destiny. 1839. Here is another excerpt um, in praise of Manifest Destiny, um, the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson in 1844, two years before the war with Mexico. In every age of the world, there has been a leading nation. one of a more generous sentiment, whose eminent citizens were willing to stand for the interests of general justice and humanity at the risk of being called by the man of that moment, chimerical and fantastic. Which should be that nation but these states? Which should lead that moment, movement, if not New England? Who should lead the leaders of the young Americans? young, progressive, educated, um, progressive, I already said that, pushing, pushing westward. Now, the following slides examine the painting American Progress. This painting is often referred to as the Manifest Destiny painting, painted in 1872, and it, it does. It exemplifies, um, embodies this idea of Manifest Destiny. There's a lot going on here. I'll read this out. This painting was created by, the, by John Gast in 1872, titled American Progress. It is often referred to as a Manifest Destiny painting. In the next few slides, I want you to get out a piece of paper and examine all the details this painting yields to us about the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist of Manifest Destiny. Here is the lower Right corner, what's going on here? What do you see? The lower right corner. We see the transformation of the land. We see farmers, ranchers plowing the fields. We see um, livestock that is not native to the land that's introduced into the, the land. We see prairies transformed into farmlands. We see natural um, animals uh, that are indigenous to the land fleeing, running away from um, transformation. We see commerce. We, it says overland mail, U.S. We see trains. Everything's going westward, right? Everything's going west. We see these pioneers, frontiersmen. Here is Um, sorry, here is the left, left center, le- left bottom, right here. So what do we see here? We see the frontiersmen going westward. Everything's going west. We see the American natives. American natives are fleeing um, Western progress. They look terrified. They're looking up at um, 
the coming westward of America, the, the push westward, uh, the Americans, and um, the angelic being Columbia, which represents the United States. Early on, um, I think before the 20th century, the United States was often embodied um, in the classical image of Columbia. And this is similar to Athens, um, Athena and Minerva, um, Rome, Roma, um, the patron saint of those city-states and, and nations. Columbia was often portrayed as the embodiment or um, the, the, the patron deity of America, Columbia. I think Uncle, after the turn of the century, 20th century, around that time, Uncle Sam became the main embodiment of America and not um, the female um, Columbia. But this is Columbia um, taking America westward and the natives are terrified. Here's Columbia. We see over here, this is the East Coast. It can be any port, it can be New York, Boston. Um, and we see commerce pushing westward, trains, train tracks, three or four train tracks. And we see this telegraph wire, telegraph, telephone wire. And in her arms, it says school book. So America is bringing progress, civilization, although Christianity isn't explicitly painted in this, in this portrait. Um, we sort of, we get a sense, right, of God's providence, especially with Columbia. She's flying like an angel. Um, she has a star in her forehead symbolizing the heavens of providence pushing america westward uh, america spreading education knowledge wisdom progress western culture westward and if you look if we stand back and look at the painting uh, as a whole um, the right side is filled with light and the dark side the left side is darker and we see this kind of painting going back um, when, um, during um, the Spanish era, um, there are paintings showing Mary um, bringing Spanish culture to the new world and um, the light is shining upon her right side, um, sig signifying European culture and, and Christianity and the left is darker, um, signifying the new world and um, a place where the Lord has not yet reigned, right? A place where um, demons and the devil have reigned since the beginning of time. And she's bringing her light, like Columbia's bringing her light westward. And here's a fuller image of, this is the painting, the entire painting. So as I was saying, on the right-hand side, we see light and progress. The Lord, even though I said, even though the, even though the guy of the Bible isn't explicitly Depicted in this painting, we, we, we get the sense that this is um, God's providence shining. Not only God's providence, but the light of civilization, the light of knowledge, the light of, of education shining bright as Columbia pushes westward and brings this light to the West that's shrouded in darkness, right? This, this is primeval. This is retrograde. Um, these animals and people were here only tilling the lands, keeping it um, as good stewards until their rightful owners, Anglo-Saxon America, come to take possession of it. And these previous occupants, the buffalo, the natives, must go away. Um, there are efforts to assimilate them, but if they cannot be assimilated, then they must go away. And we know what that means. That means extermination, genocide. We sort of get the hint of that in this painting, right? We have a dead buffalo carcass. Up here, we have a war dance going on. No doubt, um, or most likely the ghost dance. We have Overland Mail, trains, commerce, the transformation of the lands. Sorry, down here you can't see this. I have it covered up by the title. Here's a grizzly bear. A grizzly bear, elk, buffalo, are often pushed aside, right? I, I teach in Fresno, in the Central Valley of California, and I often tell my students, do you know what flora and fauna were here 100 years ago or 150 years ago? 
there were grizzlies everywhere. Where Fresno is now, there were grizzly and herds of elk and herds of wild horses. And there was a major river going to the Pacific Ocean with giant salmon and bald eagles everywhere. But now all that is gone because of the, of the transformation during the west, westward push. The land has been totally transformed into something new and different. And the grizzly that were here are gone. The last grizzly was shot in 1921 um, by a man, a hunter, who knew it was the last grizzly in California and killed it because he wanted to say he killed the last grizzly in California. All the wild elk are gone. The bald eagles have been confined, consigned to higher places in the Sierra Nevadas. And the landscape is completely transformed to something different. And it, and it really, this painting really embodies what happened in the Central Valley of California. This map shows us that as, as the original 13 states push westward um, and have this vision to overtake a continent, um, there were people already living in those areas. And when we talk about Manifest Destiny, and this was a young, progressive, educated people who were pushing westward. Um, we also have to talk about um, the black side of manifest testing that um, tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people died as America pushed westward. It's all part of the history. And this also goes to the idea of chosen people. If you know the concept of the chosen people in the Old Testament, um, where God tells the Hebrews, I chose you as my chosen people. And, but the flip side of the chosen people concept is that everyone else are dogs. And this is, I'm not making this up, this is biblical. Read, read how the God of the Old Testament describes every other nation besides the Hebrews, besides the, the sons of Jacob and Israel. They are unclean. This is where we get the, the Jewish food laws from, right? Um, everything else is unclean that's not associated with God's people. And what, what does God tell the Hebrews to do with all the people who are living in the promised land when they, they come out of Egypt? And he says, this is your promised land. Take it. Is their promised land empty? No, there are people living there. But he tells the Hebrews, this is your land. There are already people living there. Now I'm paraphrasing. He says, but I want, I, I want you to take it and kill everyone. Kill every adult, kill every child, kill every baby. And not only that, kill all the livestock because everything is dirty and unclean. Kill them all as you, as you, as you spread into your promised land. Because you are my chosen people and they are dogs. And this, this concept certainly is in play with Manifest Destiny. As the nation pushes westward, Anglo-Saxon Americans are God's chosen people. But the flip side of that is everyone else are dogs. Um, they don't, they're not um, made to the same standard in their eyes as, as white Americans. And this is how they talk. This is the language of the, of the time period. Um, savages. Um, Native Americans are savages. They're heathens. And heathen is one of the worst words in the Old Testament. A heathen is someone who worships a, worships a false god and someone who must die because of the, their um, dedication to a false god. So this slide is titled, The Bible, Chosen People. Now th these are the roots of the, of the Manifest Destiny um, ideology or zeitgeist idea. National expansion and genocide. Here are some verses from the Old Testament. As, as Israel, um, the Hebrews are spreading into the promised land. But in, in the cities of these people, which the Lord your God gives you, the promised land, for an inheritance, you shall save alive nothing that breathes. But you shall utterly exterminate them. It sounds like you're killing pests, right? Cockroaches. And this is the idea that these people were unclean. They're like roaches. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. 
so that they may not teach you all the abominable practices they have carried on for their gods and so cause you to sin against the Lord your God. It's in Deuteronomy. First Samuel, now go and smite Am Am Amalek and utterly says destroy all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both men and women, infant and suckling, a toddler, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Kill everyone, because the Lord is your God's giving you this land as a promised land. Exodus, I will send panic in front of you, and they will drive out the Hivites, Canaanites, the Hethites away from you. Leviticus, do not defile yourselves by any of these practices. For the nations I am driving out before you have defiled themselves by all these things. Numbers, you must drive out all the inhabitants of the land. Now, all these verses pro pro provide a foundation for manifest destiny. So when you think of manifest destiny, even when you think about the Spanish in Mexico killing natives, and we often, in our modern idea, we think, well, this is a contradiction of religion and spreading civilization. Well, it's not really. I mean, this idea, this modern idea that religion is supposed to be peaceful, um, there's no written rule in the universe that says that. In fact, throughout history, most often religion is very violent and is often tied to nations, nation states and peoples and tribes. Right? The God of the Old Testament is a very violent God. Quetzalcoatl, the Aztecs, and Mesoamericans is a very violent god. Thor, Mars, Ares is the reason why we have war na national war gods. Because oftentimes religion was nationalistic and violent. So there's really no contradiction. Maybe to modern Americans and modern Christians there is, but in reality throughout history, um, these ideas do not contradict each other. Um, here is Manifest Destiny and the chosen people concept in play in California as Americans spread into California. In 1856, the state of California paid 25 cents for each Indian scalp. This is the governor's office. And this was not very long ago. 25 cents for each scalp. In 1860, the bounty was increased to $5. Think about that. In California, not, not, long, not too long ago. Between 1850 and 1861, California spent $1.7 million on 24 different Indian killing militia campaigns. Congress paid the state back all but 200000 1846 to 1873, up to 16,000 natives were murdered in California by settlers, vigilantes, state militiamen, and federal soldiers. Between 1850 and 1870, Los Angeles's Indian population fell from 360, sorry, around 4,000 to 219. And here's a second painting I'd like you to, to examine and analyze. And I'd like you to do this on your own. I'd like you to, I, I will go through these slides. I would like you to pause each slide take around five to 10 minutes on each of the pre, um, subsequent slides. They, they, they all hone in on various parts of this painting and write down on um, what, what you see, what's happening. Westward, the course of empire takes its way by Emanuel Lutz, 1861. This is in the Capitol building in Washington. Beautiful painting. And it really does capture um, the zeitgeist of, of the era as these American pioneers push westward. Here's the full painting here. And the subsequent slides will detail sections of this painting.
Our last slide is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. And he was an opponent of Western expansion. He, he believed that um, in expanding America, encroaching on the rights and freedoms of other peoples was antithetical to American ideals of liberty and freedom. And he is referring specifically to the young American that uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson um, referred to in the previous quote that Lincoln is sort of making fun of um, that type of person and character. He's very sorry. This is a very sarcastic Lincoln. And you can see this type of um, young, brilliant um, lawyer mind um, writing this. And this is from his lecture on discoveries and inventions um, first delivered in 1858. And he, he says, he, the young American, owns a large part of the world by right of possessing it. And I, I think that sort of goes, goes back to Polk's speech, right? Um, our immigrants are already there, let's go possess it. Um, so I'll start over. He, the young American, owns a large part of the world by right of possessing it, and all the rest by right of wanting it and intending to have it. Young America had a pleasing hope, a fond desire, a longing after territory. He has a great passion, a perfect rage, with a new, particularly new men in op for office. In the new earth mentioned in the revelations, in which being no more sea, there must be about three times as much land as in the present. He is a great friend of humanity, and his desire for land is not selfish, but merely an impulse to extend the area of freedom. He is very anxious to fight for the liberation of enslaved nations and colonies, provided always they have land. As to those who have no land and would be glad of help from any quarter, he considers they can afford to wait a few hundred years longer. In knowledge, he is particularly rich. He knows all that can be possibly be known, inclines to believe in spiritual trappings, and is the unquestioned inventor of manifest destiny. Well, that concludes our lecture on Manifest Destiny.